Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host and Fine Woodworking Editor, Tom McKenna. And with me, as always, our Executive Art Director, Mike Pekovich. Hey, guys. And Special Projects Editor, Matt Kenny. Hello. And Ben Strano, as always, uh, our web producer is here too, and he's just sitting across the room and waving to us, trying to keep us under control. Um, before we get started with the podcast today, I need to take care of some business with a message from Woodcraft. Coming soon to the Woodcraft line of fine finishing products, the brand new Black Dog Salvage Furniture Paint and Guard Dog Top Coat. Developed for Black Dog's unique salvage-based projects, the paint features a true black and white that allow 15 colors to be mixed to create about any tint or shade one can imagine. Pre-mixed colors are also available. Contact your nearest Woodcraft store, visit woodcraft.com, or call 800-535-4482 for more information about availability. What is that stuff? Sounds like paint. Yeah, okay. Mike, he calls it paint. <laughs> salvage paint. <laughs> salvage paint. It must be paint for your shabby chic projects, hmm. Mike. Don't you think? I mean, for salvaged furniture? Salvage. I don't know. I never considered Mike uh, huh. shabby chic. You've never been to his house then. <laughs> All that arts and crafts stuff he makes is not really. He, it's shabby chic. The I, whole house. I went through a shabby chic phase, I think. I think you, we, you still are going through it, Mike. Possibly. <laughs> Just shabby. <laughs> Hey, before we uh, before we get to um, listener questions, one uh, we we get some feedback occasionally. I think one that that is pretty common is folks uh, are bummed about not being able to see some of the techniques. You know, it's the folks who who primarily listen to the podcast but don't get the chance to watch the video. And I just wanted to let folks know that. Ben, uh, the caretaker of the podcast, um, at the end of the show, will post photos and links to appropriate articles and videos um, on our webpage for each podcast episode. So if you're looking for imagery, videos, or, or further comment, um, you know, in your spare time, go back and visit that page and you'll, you'll get a full, uh, a full meal. Or you can watch the video of the podcast. Well, you can't watch it while you drive. What? <laughs> they don't let us do anything anymore in the car. <laughs> All right, let's get to some serious questions. The first one is from Greg Knuckles, uh, and he says, I just bought a Veritas Crosscut Carcass Saw as my first really good handsaw. I understand in theory how I could sharpen a handsaw myself, and the Veritas saw even comes with detailed info about tooth geometry for this purpose, but I'm a bit terrified about the possibility that I might destroy my nice new saw. Do you sharpen handsaws yourself? And roughly, how often does a handsaw need to be sharpened? So a handsaw, like when you buy a new hand plane and it shows up, you need to hone it to use it, right? Yes. A good handsaw, when you buy it and it shows up, you do not need to do anything to it to use it. Right, the operative word there being a good handsaw. Good right. handsaw. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, so yours, the Veritas saw, certainly uh, count as a good saw. So unless you really want to mess it up, don't do anything to it. Right? Don't sharpen <laughs> it. Don't sharpen it. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, we've we shown how to sharpen in the magazine in the past. Yep. It's not as intimidating as it... It's just time-consuming, and you could make a tragic error. Yes, and also I would point out that at one point in time, we were thinking about, we were talking about whether or not to do a handwork on uh, sharpening your own saw. And before we made a decision, we decided to ask some people who use hand saws quite a bit to see what they do. And we, for example, asked Chris Bexford, one of our contributing editors, someone who hand cuts dovetails all the time. And he said that his dovetail saw only needed to be sharpened about once every five years. Yeah. Think about say, that. I'd say that's true. Yeah. Cuts a lot of, mainly works in cherry, but cuts a lot of dovetails. Cuts a lot of dovetails. Yeah. So as someone who, like me, or this guy, uh, Greg Knuckles, uh, I wonder if he's really the Nucky Thomas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... Um, he probably doesn't need to sharpen his for 10 years or more, you know, depending on how many, how many, uh, so I wouldn't worry about it. And then when you do need to sharpen it, send it to somebody. Send it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's sort of like, yeah, you can learn how to do it and you could probably do it as well as anybody else could. But it's sort of like, I think if you had to sharpen your hand plane once every 10 years, you would sort of have to relearn it. Every time. Every time, I guess. Um, one thing I do on my, I, I have like an English back saw was my first ever dovetail saw. So that's like 30 years old. I've never resharpened that thing. Cuts a little bit slower. It still cuts what I have done periodically. And this is something I think it's fine to do is I keep a fine oil stone around. I will sort of dress the sides of the teeth, mm -hmm. um, put a piece of tape along one long edge um, of the stone so you're not, I don't scratch the plate itself, but just, just really lightly, you know, one or two passes um, along each face to sort of, it does kind of sharpen it a little bit. Um, you can also address if it's sort of drifting to one side or the other, you can also just by stoning one side or the other a little bit more, you can get it to cut a little bit straighter. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, I am i don't mind sort of refreshing the edge a little bit by dressing it, but um, yeah, I definitely sent it out to be sharpened. Yeah, yeah. I learned when I, I took a hand tool class with Ian Kirby a long time ago and one of the things that he talked about was dressing the saw as soon as you buy it, you know, just running it down a fine stone, you know, like, like Mike had just said was, you know, put some tape on it and protect it. Um, yeah. I mean, you can certainly get a sort of bargain price saw to perform a lot better by dressing it. You're going to, cause a lot of times the set is pretty extreme. So it makes a really wide curve. It doesn't track very well. So you can narrow up the curve. You can also, again, straighten um, the direction of cutting. Ben Blackmar, when he was here, we did a little, I think it was a Q and A or something like that. So in my shop, he got it like a, um, you know, a little back saw from a home center that, that wasn't a whole lot. It was cutting really horribly. And we went through the process for the photos of stoning it and number one, to get it to cut better and also straighter. And by like for 15 minutes of work on a bargain saw, it actually cut really well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I would say if you yeah. get a saw from Veritas or Lee Nielsen or Bad Axe or any of the other high quality uh, boutique makers, yeah. Don't do anything to the saw. Yeah, yeah, see how it works, and then, then yeah, you should not have to do anything to the saw at all. Same with guitars. If you get a really good guitar, you should never tune it. It should stay. You should send it back to the factory to be tuned. <laughs> I think Ben just erped. <laughs> <Ben. laughs> <laughs> well, Ben cleans that up. Well, let's move on to the next question. <laughs> Did you say you burped? <laughs> erped? <laughs> erped? This one comes from Kramer, but not the Kramer. Um, he says, I have Norton's combo 220, 1000, and 4000 slash 8000 stones and think I've been getting decently sharp. Is there any reason to invest in the Shapton 10,000 stones or 10,000 plus stones, rather? They do look damn sexy, but will I see any difference in the surface left behind? They are a sexy stone. They, they, yeah, they're hot. They're sleek. They're frosted glass on Just one side. Just stop now. And you don't, and you don't, don't have care. to keep them soaking in water. You know? So how much you like woodworking, it is not acceptable to describe a water stone as sexy. I disagree. <laughs> I don't know. Kramer did. Um, there <laughs> is, here's the difference between Norton's and Shapton's that I sort of found out the hard way. Um, they're not graded exactly the same so that an 8,000 grit Norton, which is finest Norton, um, is actually a finer stone than the 8,000 grit Shapton. How do I know this? Well, I got some sexy Shaptons in the same grits as my Nortons, 1,000, 4,000, 8,000, because I travel a lot and teach and the Shaptons because they're so non-porous, you don't have to soak them at all. So you don't have to keep them in a Tupperware and they're a little less messy to work with. But the 8,000 grit stone, it was leaving, you know, a coarser scratch pattern, noticeably a coarser scratch pattern than the 8,000 grit Norton. And I went online and, and sure enough, the, the grades are just a little bit different. And, and actually a 10,000 grit Shafton is equivalent to 8,000 grit Norton. So to that standpoint, yeah, you need to go a little bit finer with the Shafton. Um, what I ended up doing is adding a 16,000 grit Shafton stone to my set. So it's like, uh, okay, do I notice a big difference between the 16,000 grit Shapton and the 8,000 grit Norton? Uh, no, not really. 
uh, in That's terms a- of performance. Hmm. I think the bigger issue is if I see any scratches, I think it, it's usually scratches left over from a coarser grit that I didn't adequately take out through that process. So it'll be shiny, shiny, shiny with a scratch here or there, which is definitely not caused by that fine stone. So for me, it's making sure I uh, spritz off the blade and the honing guide wheel, especially so I'm not bringing grit from a coarser stone onto my finer stones. Um, I think that's probably a, a good thing to go. But the notion of going to, and I think Shapton even has like a 30,000 grit, which uh, I, I don't know what the benefits are for that. That's for planing aluminum. Yeah. So plain irons, I typically go with my uh, Norton stones and I go 8,000 on my plain irons. Where I do always go 16,000 grit are on my Japanese chisels because I, I, and I don't know if this is true. I think it's true. It feels like it's true is that the grain structure for the steel and Japanese chisels is fine enough so that you do notice the difference between the 8,000 grit Norton and the 16,000 grit Shapton. So for some reason, I always go 16,000 grit on my Japanese tools and typically stay at 8,000 for everything else. So you use the Norton 8,000 grit stone for all your A2 blades? Yep. Do you? So when I maybe, I don't know how old your Nortons are, but I had some that I probably bought 15 years ago, something yeah, like the, that. Is your 8,000 the yellow? It's a Yeah, but it's a, it was a combo stone just like this guy has. Yeah, so my... Mine are older. It's it's the eight thousand grit is that sort of rust brown color. Uh, but I had problems with A two until I went to the ruler trick with my plain irons. Yeah. So that I'm yeah. just removing just a little bit. And that I had to do that before I felt I was getting as sharp as the carbon steel blades on my Shaptons. Yeah, because what I noticed with uh the Norton stones and A two steel is that uh, they wouldn't get as polished as they should because, uh, and I spoke to some people about it, and they, no one knows exactly why, but I think it has something to do with the swarf that's being created, okay, and that the the steel dust come what are ever, f- uh, filings coming off the uh, the 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 blade is yeah. causing those uh, scratches, huh. and um, I also found that the Nortons cut kind of slow for a2 i don't know if you think that or not but uh I, what i ended up buying to replace them was some uh power you know, sigma power select water stones and uh they're like twice as fast at really? least mm-hmm. and okay. uh the polish they leave on a2 is f- fantastic hmm. well, so. yeah i noticed when i went when i first bought an a2 Blade and I have those same <clears throat> Norton combo stones. I I noticed it that it was taking me longer to get where I wanted mm-hmm. to be, and I wasn't getting that that fine polish. And then I went out and bought a ten thousand grit um, Japanese water stone. I can't remember what brand it was, but uh, I didn't notice much of a difference in terms of the grit. Maybe it's the same same issue that the ten thousand grit stone that I bought is equal to the eight. And so I'm not really getting okay. much of a difference, but well, I, I have a 13,000 grit stone and it's, it's a noticeable difference between the Norton 8,000 and this 13,000. Hmm. I also have a 20,000 grit stone that, uh, made by hello kitty. And, uh, <laughs> it's really does a nice job polishing. Nice. Glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, okay. Hey, that's a, that's a perfect transition to, uh, uh, our confessional booth of smooth moves. What would you do with a brain so, if you had one? Um, do you want to head up, Matt, first? Uh, sure, I'll go first. So uh, yesterday when we started talking about the podcast, I had a smooth move in mind, uh, and it related to cutting some little lattice pieces for uh, the base of a recent box I had made. And that was, you know, kind of stupid, but I recovered from it quickly, moved on. And last night... Uh, I was in my shop working on box 52, the last of da, my boxes, da, da. Mike, which I will finish all 52 in 52 weeks. Awesome. Still have not seen a single beer from Ed or Mike, but, um, Ed, yeah, Ed Pernick, you remember him? No. Oh. Peppermint Pernick <laughs> <laughs> used to work here. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I, and I had, Shell, I was doing the shellac on the boxes and the dividers for the compartments. Okay. And I was going to glue them in last night and then today get in my shop ready to make all the lids. 
So I shellac everything and I'm, I'm like, all right, time to glue them in. And I started with the uh, first box, first one, put some glue in the dado, slid the divider in. Of course, now it's a little tight because it has shellac on it. Yep. And uh, I get it down, I push it down, and that's when I remembered that all of my dividers were about a 32nd of an inch too tall. And often what I do is cut them a little bit tall and then put them in upside down and hand plane the bottom okay. flush. So because the top has a rabbit on it, you don't want to mess up the rabbit. Right. So, uh, and I forgot to do that. Hmm. So I immediately realized this and I freak out. I'm like, Oh, I got to get this thing out. But it was really hard to put it in and it is not coming back out. <laughs> it is. Not, and I'm just told, I'm like, Oh man, I cannot believe this. Cause it basically the box is ruined, right? If it gets stuck in there and glued in there, that box is toast. Yes. Um, so I'm completely freaking out. And I think, okay, how am I going to get this out? Because I really I can't get a good enough grip on it. So I'm like, okay, get a silicone pad from the kitchen, a little silicone grippy pad, you know? Okay, right, for opening your jars, jars, and, jars and, and stuff. So yeah. I go up and get one, and, I'm, and it's not moving. It's not moving. And I'm like, well, you know. Hammer time? Well, not hammer. <laughs> channel lock plier time. Nice. Oh, So I was like, I got to get it out because I can always remake yeah. the divider. So channel lock pliers, I was kind of hoping actually that I could pull it out without damaging it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no. It like, you know, a piece of it just ripped off because the grain was running uh -huh. out towards the top. And right. But I got it out. So, um, and fortunately, uh, when I do little dividers like this, I usually make extra stock. Uh, <clears throat> so I probably made up an extra foot and a half to two feet of, of stock. Uh, so they already had pieces with the rabbits cut in them and everything. So all this morning I went down before work and I was able to, in about 20 minutes, mm -hmm. have a new uh, divider fit and I shellacked it before work. It went in perfect. So, cool. But it was a colossal. I, I was just totally freaking out wow. last night. So that's not going to cause you to miss your deadline or anything? Is Absolutely it? not. Good. No, and if it were, I, I mean, I wouldn't have come into work today. Screw the podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I got boxes to make. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Mike? What's your uh, smoothie for today? Um, this is a smooth move, narrowly averted. This is probably a smooth move in the past because it's something I think we're all prone to make. And as much as I admonish people not to do it, I fall into the trap myself. So um, I have a couple few weeks between uh, classes I'm teaching. So um, I wanted to use that time to get in the shop and actually make something that wasn't class related or magazine related or anything like that. Um, but like a lot of us, when you're presented with a small window of opportunity in the shop, you don't want to waste it. You want to get out there and start making something. So, um, you know, the smooth move is always getting out and starting to mill stock and cut parts before you really know what you're making. Um, which for me is, is kind of a bummer because I think you compromise all that effort and work you put into something if you don't give thought into what you're making in the first place. So um, as an excuse to actually make something, there was this little portion of a wall in our house that currently had a small wall cabinet filling the space. However, theoretically, you could actually fit a slightly larger wall cabinet in that space. And that was reason enough to, oh, I need a new wall cabinet. I can make more efficient <laughs> use of this space. So... But because of that, because I wanted to fill out the space a little bit more, the proportions of this cabinet, it was like almost square. It was just vertical of square. It was a really clunky shape. But I said, well, I'll put a couple uh, drawers in there and some shelves. It'll be kind of cool. And I was drawing it up, and I was even ready to go at lunchtime to cut some lumber and stuff. And I was just looking at it. It's like, it's kind of clunky. And Matt came over to my cube to take a look at it. Not that I was designing personal projects at work. <laughs> Buddy was designed for some projects at work. Time. But uh, this is a cool thing about working with other woodworkers, especially talented designers like Matt. He looked at it and said, you know, if you had, if you ran the vertical divider full height, it would create two more vertical shapes within that sort of clunky shape and refine things just a bit. And then that was enough. The light bulb went on and I spent 
no more time at work, but I did spend additional time um, <laughs> playing with that concept and, and really sort of coming up with a design that worked a lot better. And I was really excited about making. So now that I'm in the shop and I'm cutting dovetails and through mortise and, and tenons, which are, you know, not, you know, it's, it's not really enjoyment in and of itself, but um, it's nice to be working and spending the time on the joinery, knowing it's going towards a design that I'm really excited about making. So uh, smooth move of just going in and just cutting lumber before you're thinking about it, narrowly av averted. And many thanks to Matt for his design input. I was thinking your smooth move might be, you know, don't design at work, but. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's worked for me so far. I don't know. No, I just, just want to make sure that Ben, we get a little outtake of that, what Mike just said, where he admitted that I was brilliant and we just. Oh, oh God. I kn uh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. My new smooth move. <laughs> <laughs> I opened my mouth yes. <laughs> and praised Matt. Uh, it's funny. Yesterday, I when we had our pre-production meeting, I, I didn't have a smooth move in mind. And uh, lo and behold, you know, last night, I had a smooth move occur. I, my issue is always um, finding time in the shop. And my brought up a good point about, you know, every, every moment is valuable. So I raced home yesterday. I, um, I helped coach my daughter's softball team. So we had a game, get home from the game, eat dinner, think, Oh, you know, I think I have about an hour to, to put together this case that I'm making for a, a chestnut stand. And so I have, I'm making the, the case out of plywood and I was just going to use biscuits to, to assemble the, the case. And uh, I didn't want any end grain of the plywood edges exposed on the sides. And I had a plan to, you know, just zip, zip, zip it out. And lo and behold, I cut the biscuit slots in the wrong slot on the wrong sides. And so now I've got an assembly where the edges are going to show and I can't really fix it. Um, my only fix really is to, to flip over. I think the the horizontal pieces, and then I can hide the the erroneous slots. But I, once I realized I did that last night, I packed up and I went back upstairs and <laughs> thinking, oh my gosh, you know, it's just so hard to you know jump in and jump out, yes. you know, like an hour at a time. And you know, I had all the parts cut <clears throat> over the weekend, and you know, I took a break smartly at that point. But you know, it's just not a, a hobby that you want to dive into when you're exhausted or um, distracted. So, you know. Yeah, I've something I've worked on in the last year to really force myself to do is to know when to stop working in the shop. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Yeah. So that you don't start making mistakes. Right. And it's usually after about the sixth or seventh beer. This is has been another okay. distasteful joke brought to you by All right. Matt Kenny. Um, <laughs> let's get back to our questions. Um and this one comes from Mike Vukas. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but uh, Mike says... I've no, Mike is how you say it. <clears throat> Mike. <laughs> Mike would be correct, yes. <laughs> I have a DeWalt DW735 surface planer that I've owned for about six years. <clears throat> Excuse me. My, my day job keeps me out of my shop or has kept me out of my shop for the last several years, so the planer has been sitting idle. Recently, I tried to run some stock through it, and the drive wheels were slipping and not feeding the stock through. Cleaning the rollers with denatured alcohol seemed to work, but a couple months later, I had the same experience. Is there something I should be doing to keep the drive rollers working properly in between projects? And also, is the alcohol safe for the wheels? Only if they're 21. Uh, first of all, he needs to get a new day job. So <laughs> That's step one. Step one. Get a job. Give yourself more time. Get a better job. Give yourself more time. Yeah. Step two, I would guess... Mike, that uh, it's probably really, his knives could be dull, although he's not using it. So, but a lot of times, the when you have trouble feeding a board through a planer, it's because the knives are dull. Yeah, especially the Waltz, like the one we have in the shop, they're rubber feed rollers. Yeah. So, whenever the feed rollers start slipping in the DeWalt in the shop, you flip the knives over, all of a sudden the feed rollers work great. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Um, I also think, you know, that, that length of time between use, I know like the rubber can sort of get, it gets kind of shiny yeah. and hard. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if that, if, you know, that lack of service on the rubber. So he said he cleaned the rubber and it worked a little bit better. Um, is alcohol the best stuff to use on that? What, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't we know did what. cover it once in a, in a Q and A. 
I think John White answered it. I cannot remember what he recommended. I have a feeling it was mineral spirits. That's what I thought. I thought it was some some kind of a solvent based. Uh, yeah, mineral thing. spirits is definitely like a lot of times if you are doing white pine uh, a lot, you'll get that uh, resin on it, and then you clean them with uh, mineral spirits will dissolve that and get okay. rid of it. Right, and that's how you clean that up. So I would think mineral spirits would be fine. A lesson I learned once uh, is that whenever you're going to use a cleaner. Start with the least caustic one, yeah, and then progress up. I once missigned a corporate credit card, and uh, I tried to clean it off to re-sign it, and I went straight to acetone, and it just totally like stripped off everything off the card. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so go with the least caustic cleaner first. Well, it's funny he did <clears throat> say that he he hadn't used it. it. Looks sounds like several years. So maybe Mike is onto something about the rubber not being pliable anymore. But you know, if it's been that long, it could be that. I I don't think that was. I've had my Dewalt planer like this for yeah. eight years, and. The, there's nothing wrong with the feed yeah. rollers, and yeah. it wouldn't matter if you're using it or not. It yeah. would, they, you know, if they're going to get hard and unusable, that would happen regardless. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it's probably dull knives. But yeah, yeah. flip them around. Yeah, Try I, fresh I guess. Yeah. And then if you're going to forge signatures on credit cards, practice first. <laughs> yes. I think that's the real don't, lesson. Don't to go there. to acetone. Well, the problem was I misspelled Pekovich when I signed it. <laughs> <laughs> I still I still couldn't spell your name back then. I can't either. Yeah. I was wondering what that trip was that Mike took. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to uh, more questions. This one is from Dan. That's an easy one to pronounce. Um, we always hear about the careful choice of hand planes, their length, width, blade types, etc. But is there any comments on the appropriate length of sanding blocks? I saw a photo of a woodworker fairing a curve with a standard quarter sheet size block and wondered if the length mattered. Would you get better results with a longer block? Uh, I learned a very so, good tip when I was in studying woodworking in England, and uh, that's that if you stretch your arm out and you measure the distance from your nose to your thumb and you take one-third of that and then have that again, that's how long your sanding block should be. I thought that's only if you're a king. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this question strikes me as a little funny. <laughs> um, but it, it's a good question. <laughs> well, I have my normal sanding block, and um, I think you guys were talking about sanding blocks for fairing curves, um, which is different. But my sanding blocks, I always use quarter sheet of sandpaper. Mm -hmm. um, so my blocks are, you know, the size to where... You can wrap a sheet of paper around it and get most use. But then also um, you can flip the paper 90 degrees and still wrap it around the block to use those extra edges that never quite get used. Yep. Um, but the one thing I've started doing, Michael Fortune recommended it. Bob Van Dyke has a bunch of these at, at uh, his shop. Is Rather than a sanding block with a rounded cork pad or something on the bottom that you wrap sandpaper over, um, you get double stick uh, or sticky back sandpaper and you put it on the bottom of a block and trim it really exactly to the edge of a block without rounded corners. So you have the, the sanding medium going right to the edge of a block and that's really great for getting into corners. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. so I've got a couple few of those things around in addition to my uh, sanding blocks that I use that are cork back that I use for loose paper. Yeah, I've made sanding sticks in similar fashion that but there's no reason why i should have just made a full block <laughs> yeah for curves i uh have found the longer the better um so if you're i mean if you're already working in curves i mean there's a good chance you'll have what i like to use is uh wiggle wood you know it's like oh, three really? inch, three eight oh, yeah. inch thick flexible the plywood, plywood. Okay. which you can buy usually you can buy those at uh lumber yards geared towards the construction industry mm, yeah. you know and those are everywhere yeah. So you probably you probably can't find it at a home center, but somewhere like that you can. And that stuff is very flexible, but also it gives the sandpaper some uh, rigidity. Mm -hmm. So it, the, it almost be, it becomes like a hand plane. And so when you're uh, sanding a curve, it'll knock down the high spots but miss the okay. low spots. And you'll start to really fare that curve yeah. and make it smooth. And uh, it, it's flexible – both for concave and convex curves. And it worked really nice for that. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. But when you are sanding a curve, you do want to give some kind of backing to the sandpaper to so that it doesn't act like a plane in, in that regard. And you can use, I mean, you could use like eighth inch hardboard, eighth inch plywood. It's just that, that stuff doesn't bend as easily hmm. and can be a little bit harder to keep uh, at the right radius. Whereas uh, wiggle wood is fantastic or uh, bending ply. Is bending ply. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've used off cuts curved off cuts for sanding but i i always have to clean up the edges before i sand with it or at least i do it just thinking it may make a difference but i think the longest sanding blocks probably work better because i've seen guys who work with curves use them <laughs> yeah i yeah. think fortune uses that kind of uh sanding block as well so also the benefit of, of backing the sandpaper on curves like that is that you're keeping the face nice and square you're not right. rounding over the cross yep. section while you're trying to smooth mm -hmm. out the long curve yeah exactly Yep. So, hmm. is that all we have to say about the, the length, length of your sanding blocks? blocks? So, well, Ben was saying, Ben, what did you use on your little table arches to smooth? Did you use like quarter inch MDF uh, or something? Uh, eighth inch hardboard. Okay. Did you hear, he said, once again, he said he used corn dogs to sand his <laughs> legs. <laughs> it's very odd. Twice boiled. <laughs> 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 all right, let's move on uh, to our all-time favorite technique of all time for this week. And uh, I'll let Mike jump into the fray right away. Um, <clears throat> once again, my all-time favorite technique of this week is something that I saw on Instagram. Um, last one was by um, Tim, Rousseau. Tim Rousseau. This one is by Adrian Ferrazzuti, but he mentioned in his little video that he actually, or his post that he got this from Tim Rousseau. So like Tim Rousseau is like the man for best techniques of all time. Um, Adrian Ferrazzuti, who is a masterful woodworker and designer, uh, his chairs have been on the back of the magazine. He's written articles for us, great at marketry, really, really good stuff. But I really like his feed because um, a lot of his solutions for things I won't say down and dirty, but they're really fast and efficient. Like yeah, like Michael Fortune and a lot of other really good makers who are great designers, they're really good at coming up with um, really simple solutions to do something rather challenging in a really accurate way really quickly. So he was, I think he was making something, it looked like a trestle table where the foot of the trestle had an arch along the top. So as this post is tenoned into this arched foot, um, you could do one of two things. You could either create a flat along the arch so this post can come in nice and square. But rather than do that, he wanted to create sort of an inside curve on the shoulder of the post so it matched the arch of the foot. A more elegant solution. Kind of a tough thing to do. So, But his solution was great. He took his arch, which the foot, which was already done, and he covered it with packing tape or saran wrap or something like that. And then he sort of roughed out um, an inside curve on a piece of, let's say, plywood, three-quarter inch plywood or MDF or something. Um, and then he smeared that with Bondo and pushed that right up against the leg itself. So he basically used this- Against the foot. Against the foot, right, this arch. And so what he was doing was creating a template that exactly matched the curve of the arch. And he cleaned that, the surfaces up with that and used that as a routing template to then route that inside curve on the post. And it was like brilliant. And as he pushed these things together, it was like perfect. And mm -hmm. if, you know, if you were to sit there and try to like scribe it and chisel it, it's like, uh, -uh it's never going to happen. Um, so, I mean, it would be more uh, authentic if you did it all by hand. But the way he did it was much smarter. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> take advantage of technology. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that stuff is smelly, though. <laughs> so yeah, hats off to Adrian and Tim um, for um, continued expertise in problem solving. Tell you that Tim Rousseau is a smart woodworker. Yeah. He really is. Probably smart enough to where he should be doing something else he other should than be. making furniture. Yeah. Maybe ph teaching philosophy. <sighs> Come on now. <laughs> 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 all right, Matt. What's your uh, favorite technique of all time for this uh, week? For this week? Uh, well, it's actually, I don't know if it really counts as woodworking. I'm going to pull a Pekovich here oh, no. and give a non, an answer that isn't really an answer. Uh, no. Um, so I've been making boxes, by the way. 
Have and, you? Yes. Really? Hmm. And some of the boxes have these little pulls on them where there's little feet, and then there's a bar that runs between the uh, connected, holding the two feet together. So it's like a little uh, bar pull. Like a post kind of thing. Like two posts and a... Well, sure. Right. Feet. <laughs> feet. <laughs> feet. Little, feet. Little, little, uh, feet. little feet. Little baby, baby feet. Little baby feet. No, like little... Uh, what, do you, what would you call them, Mike? Pylon? They're not pylons. <laughs> Cylons? No, they're not Cylons. Yes, Different a show. bar with little posts yeah. on each end. Sure. All right, we'll yeah. call it that. They're not really posts, though. But um, Ben will post a photo. Yeah, we'll put a photo <laughs> up. And uh, so I made some of those, and I would, you know, like do painted feet, Coco Bolo bar, and all this. And then I decided uh, to try a technique on them that I had learned, that I had done earlier on in box number four, where I wrapped hemp around a uh, key ring <clears throat> to make a circular pull that was covered in hemp. And uh, I've also done it with thread around metal rings. And I, and I learned, so the technique comes from there and I will show it on the, on this uh, bar pull that I make. And the technique is how to uh, secure the string or the thread when you begin it and when you end it without using any knots because right. the knots would be unsightly, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, The to begin it, I use a technique that I learned from tying flies. And uh, what you do there basically is I uh, lay the string down on the bottom of the bar. It started in the middle and go back towards one end and then begin to wrap the string over the bar and and cover up that length of thread that's laid down. Right. So usually there I'll do like half an inch to uh, three quarters of an inch and cover that up, and that's not coming out because the string that or the thread that's being wrapped around it is super tight, and uh, it's going to hold that still or hold capture it. And then when I'm about a quarter inch from the other end of the little bar pull. I'll uh, take a separate piece of thread and bend it over so it's kind of like a loop with an open end, I'll open on the other end, and lay that down and begin to wrap the thread over it. And yep. this is on the bottom. And you just keep wrapping it, wrap it around until you're done. And then you take the loose end of the wound thread and stick it through the loop and then take the other end of the loop and pull it back. And it pulls the loop and also the loose end of your wound thread back under all of the thread and uh, secures it there as well. Yep. And that technique I learned from Mike, uh, or Mike told me about. Yeah, so um, uh, that's my all-time cool. favorite. So it makes for very nice, uh, elegant uh, pulls. And I learned that technique. In high school, one of my jobs was making and repairing fishing rods at Fisherman's Hardware in Long Beach, California. Um, and the little eyelets mm -hmm. on the rods, you know, they are wrapped and it's done exactly that same way. That's how I learned how to do that. Yeah, that's how they cool. start it too? Yep. Start yeah. it and end it with that little loop and pull it through and there you go. Oh, you start yeah. it with a loop? No, start it exactly the with way the, you mentioned. Uh, so you yeah, wrap yeah. over Lay the tail and wrap right. a ways mm -hmm. and then put the loop in there when you finish it up. Yeah, and if you're using like a thin, like I'm actually using like embroidery thread and uh, you cannot you cannot tell at all because it's so thin. With something thicker like the hemp twine or something, I think you would be able to. Yeah, you got to kind of watch where you're placing yeah. it. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it makes a, a really nice, elegant pull. Yeah, very cool. Neat. Well, I have a um, <clears throat> all-time favorite technique of all time for this week that also I, I kind of got from Mike. And Mike was uh, one of the people that was, you know, teaching me about basically doing mock-ups. And, you know, before you commit to wood, you know, experiment with paper, cardboard, whatever you have around. And so I, I'm building this chest on stand and I have an idea of what I want up top, but I don't know, I wasn't sure about proportion. It was hard to tell from my, my sketches about what was going to look right in real life. And so um, I took an idea from him and, and grabbed a box that I had and I put it on there. And the funny thing is, I've never had this happen before where I put something on and it was like perfect, like right. Cool. Like the box was the perfect proportion. Usually I'm kind of taping things on and trying to either make the box bigger or smaller and it worked out 
perfectly. So, but that's that's one step. But I'm taking another idea from Mike in terms of the the blue tape trick, where I used to sketch the layout on the box and then I'd erase, and it was kind of clunky and it never really worked out. So what I started doing is I took some thinner blue tape and just started taping like dividers and what a door oh, might cool. look like. And um, it's really cool. What I so what I do is I tape up kind of a, a facade on the front. And then walk away and then come back the next day and see, well, that looks pretty good. Or maybe not. And I'll take a photo with my phone and then keep the previous version and then, you know, go back and do something different. And so I've got two iterations so far that I think are almost doable, but I think I have some more work to do. But it's really a neat technique and I don't waste any wood and I'm going to know, you know, three-dimensionally what the what the piece is going to look like. Awesome. So. I'm very happy that box maker was so good at furniture design. What? 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 <laughs> <laughs> the box. The, the box was perfect for my. Uh, for my case, oh, I so. see. I, I think Mike's evolution as a furniture maker. Eventually, he will make furniture using only white oak planks and blue tape. There will be no tools involved. It'll just be white oak and blue tape. <laughs> or just blue tape. How about that? Just blue tape. I don't know how he'll do yeah. it, but he'll figure it well, out. My daughter makes duct tape boxes. Yeah, my daughter makes stuff out of yeah. book. Uh, so why not? Duct tape, too. I have quite a few Father's Day duct tape wallets. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah those are coming. I had a friend from college who made a duct tape uh, suit once mm. and wore that to a party. My son, when he was in Boy Scouts, Very sweaty. He, he went to the, the week-long <laughs> summer camp and brought lots of rolls of duct tape with him to make wallets and such, and he was the hit of the party. And um, we were never really, really called during the week he was at camp, but afterwards we were told that there was to be no more duct tape at Boy Scout camp. Because they actually were duct taping little kids to poles. To trees. There <laughs> was the an incident where someone was duct taped to a tree. Uh, yes, <laughs> so... <laughs> So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, next question. This one comes from Julian Gall. And uh, hold on, Matt. You, this is a long question, so you may want to just stretch. Well, just wake me up when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and Julian writes, some styles of furniture require rounded over edges or chamfers as part of their design. But how do you treat the edges when the style requires a square edge? To leave them as they come off the plane or jointer seems too sharp. Do you chamfer them with a plane? Do you run some sandpaper down the edges? Do you do the same to all the edges on the piece, for example, vertical and horizontal edges? Um, and how do you treat the edges around the front of a flush-fitting drawer? Do you apply the same degree of rounding or chamfering to a small box as to a larger piece? Now, that's a pretty loaded question, but uh, I think it's uh, some good it's a topics. Lot of questions. Yeah. A lot of questions. Matt, you work most of your work has really clean, crisp edges and corners. Yes. How do you go about that? I just let people get cut. Teaches them not to touch my stuff. <laughs> he has a sandpaper <laughs> tongue. He just licks it. Don't touch my stuff. I'm like Francis <laughs> in Stripes. And I don't like nobody touching my uh, stuff. Uh, usually, Relax, Francis. <laughs> settle down, Francis. Lighten up, Francis. Um, so I have found... Uh, through experimentation that I will break the edges of something um, with the last grit of sandpaper that I use. And that'll either be 320 or 400. Okay. Um, with 320 grit sandpaper, it takes about two passes along the corner to break it enough to where you're not going to cut yourself, but also leave it looking sharp. So visually it's sharp, but visually just to sharp. the touch it is Right. Cool. And with 400 grit paper, it's about four passes uh, to break it just enough for it to be safe, but not uh, not look uh, chamfered. Cool. Yeah. So I do a lot of chamfers on my work um, with a block plane, but all sort of keep that same practice in mind that if I'm doing any surface prep after hand planing, which is almost always, I'll avoid those chamfered edges um, until I get to the very, very finest grit. And then I'll always use a block and I'll use the sanding block in the same manner I would use a block plane while we're trying to really maintain a consistent angle so that those chamfers don't turn into mushy rounded mm -hmm. over corners. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I do the same thing. I, when I when I first um, made an arts and crafts type piece many many years ago, <clears throat> and um, I remember I built it in the shop when I was still the copy editor at the magazine, and everyone came out and said, "Oh, you got to ease those edges," and I was like, "What the heck are you talking about?" And they said, "Well, you're going to either dent it easily, mm. or someone's going to you know get a cut or something." So I. Not knowing exactly what they meant, I went and I rounded them over. <laughs> it looked awful. <laughs> so yeah, but, it's you know now I I've learned a lot since then. But my what I normally do is I I chamfer lightly with a block plan. But sometimes I still feel like those edges are still a little bit pointy. But I think I'm I'm in line with Matt and Mike where I just take a a block of typically two twenty and I just zip zip a couple times and it's it's nice and soft and i still get a little bit of a shimmer from the the chamfer chamfered edge so um I yeah think it's a good idea yeah. here's well, something that well underlined both what mike and i said and i guess what you're saying as well tom is that uh we both hold off on chamfering until that last stage yeah. of prep and at that stage your piece is already assembled yes at least it is for me I think and you do not want to chant for corners before assembly because let's say that you chant for the pieces of a uh, of a wall cabinet and you do a chamfer and then you fit that divider in and if that divider is meant to be flush with the front edges right all of a sudden there's a little chamfer there and so you have a, a gap yeah you a create visual a visual gap. gap where there wasn't one because you took really good care in your joinery to have really yeah. precise joinery yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, but if you wait till after assembly then you can chamfer all the way around uh, any uh, edges mm -hmm. in in um, with the sandpaper or whatever and uh, and not have those gaps I chamfered before assembly on the base that I made because I was worried that I wouldn't be able to get a, you know, a hand plane all the way across. It would hit the leg and then I would have to take a chisel to do the final one. But I, I chamfered with a plane and I'm, I, I went back with the sandpaper at the end. Well, that's, yeah. After assembly is where we go back to the earlier question from this podcast where Nookie Thomas asked us about sanding blocks. Yeah. I don't even think that was the right guy. But, uh, if you have a sand, like a piece of MDF with adhesive sandpaper on it that goes right up to the sharp yeah. corner of the yeah. MDF, <clears throat> you can sand right up to a leg yes. and, yeah. and get that nice little chamfer. Yep. Yeah. What I was going to say on parts where I'm, I almost always hit my corners with a block plane, but where I want a little more friendly to the touch edge rather than rounding over with sandpaper, for instance, on the top. Um, edges of my drawer sides where they're likely to come in contact with your hand or something. A sharp chamfer might not be, you know, that inviting to the touch. What I'll do is I'll do an initial uh, pass with a block plane at 45 degrees to create a chamfer and then hit it, sort of bisect that. So go 22 and a half, you know, vertically, 22 and a half horizontally. So really you're creating a three facet edge there. But to the touch, it feels exactly like a rounded over edge. And I find that's a little bit more precise. And it also sort of creates a more visually precise look, but still being a little bit more friendly to the touch. Yeah, I think that kind of touches on what he's getting at. The, the What Julian is getting at is like where to chamfer. I, I chamfer any place that could be touched. And I even do, like Mike just said, I do the, the tops of drawer sides as well. So any yep. place that you know, a hand is going to come into contact with, I, I right. chamfer it. So here's a, a, a question I was thinking about. When I was thinking about this question, and I started to think, well, where do you round over? Like, where would I put a round over, like an eighth inch rat, router bit round over? Nowhere. I don't think I would ever round over anything. I did, um, but it was for a door, you know, it was a, a, a pivoting hinge door you know, where I had to round over the bottom edge so it would clear the, the front of the, the case. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't with a router. I did it all with a, with a hand plane. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, no, not as part of a design, you know, a visual edge or something like that. It's whenever I, factory I, I do, like, a rounded edge, typically it's in conjunction with a, either an heiress, which would be sort of like a hard intersection between a curve and a flat, or a fillet, like on a thumbnail profile. Yes. So yeah. anything, because a rounded edge, it's just deadly in terms of the light hitting, and it. it gives it such a soft, amorphous look that really 
light and shadow is what defines the the sort of the, the shape of, in detail of your piece. But a truly rounded edge, there's almost no definition there. Yeah, right. there's no life to it. Yeah. And know. also they look, uh, well, where I see round overs a lot is when someone makes something and they screw it up. And a round over, or over like along an edge, will hide some mistakes. Yeah. You know, so I see a lot of that. And but I've also seen a lot, unfortunately, a lot of boxes where guys just rounded over everything on the box, like with you know, like a three sixteenth inch round over bit, and it just it looks terrible. I guess is what I'm saying to you, objectively speaking. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, that's about all we have time for today. Um, tune in again in two weeks on May 13th for our next episode. In the meantime, don't forget to visit finewoodworking.com to keep up with our tool giveaway for the 40th anniversary. The current prize is Rikon's new 14-inch bandsaw. It's an awesome prize. Uh, to win it, you must enter by May 9th. To enter, go to findwoodworking.com slash 40 sweeps. That's the number 40. Again, that's findwoodworking.com slash 40 sweeps. By the way, your questions give us content, so please keep sending them. Email them to shoptalk at taunton.com, and you can send comments to that address as well. Please spread the word about Shop Talk Live to your woodworking friends and neighbors. You can catch the podcast via iTunes. And while you're there, please give us the all-powerful five-star rating. You can also stream the podcast on the web at shoptalklive.com or catch us on iHeartRadio. Finally, you can keep up with fine woodworking, woodworking on Instagram and on Facebook and look for Matt, Ben, Mike, and me on Instagram as well. Thanks for listening and have fun in the shop. Well, I got some sexy Shaptons. Sexy Shaptons. Sexy Shaptons. Well, I got some sexy Shaptons. Sexy Shaptons. Sexy Shaptons. They are a sexy stone. They're sleek. They're frosted glass on one side. They are a sexy stone. Is here's the difference between Norton's and Shapton's that I sort of found out the hard way. They're not graded exactly the same, so that an 8,000 grit Norton, which is finest Norton, um, is actually a finer stone than the 8,000 grit Shapton. How do I know this? Well, I got some sexy Shapton's, Shapton's. in the same grits as my Norton's, 1,000, 4,000, 8,000, because I travel a lot and teach, and the Shapton's, because they're so non-porous, you don't have to soak them at all, so you don't have to keep them in a Tupperware, and they're a little less messy to work with. But the 8,000 grit stone, it was leaving you know, a coarser scratch pattern, noticeably a coarser scratch pattern than the 8,000 grit Norton. And I went online, and, and sure enough, the, the grades are just a little bit different. And, and actually, a 10,000 grit Shafton is equivalent to 8,000 grit Norton. So to that standpoint, yeah, you need to go a little bit finer with the Shafton. Um, what I ended up doing is adding a 16,000 grit Shafton stone to my set. So it's like, uh, okay, do I notice a big difference between the 16,000 grit Shafton and the 8,000 grit Norton? Not really. And, uh, and, uh, sexy Shaptons. Sexy Shaptons. And, uh, sexy Shaptons. And, uh, sexy Shaptons. They are a sexy stone.